Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the October uh, meeting of the Hong Kong Study Circle and Hong Kong Philatelic Society. Uh, the meeting is sponsored by the, the FIAP, uh, Federation of Inter-Asia Philatelic, and uh, we are very grateful for their sponsorship. And uh, the, this meeting is, I believe, is, is mostly a one-man show. Uh, the speaker tonight uh, is obviously, I uh, needs no introduction, but I would obviously introduce Ingo as our vice president of North America. And, uh, you know, he's a very nice guy. I've met him several times in Hong Kong and elsewhere in London, for example. And he has, uh, is, is a vast collection of Hong Kong uh, and he specializes in several areas. And one of them is, of course, uh, these exotic uh, destinations. Um, I mean, dead countries is obviously uh, it's only a part of it. Um, but I think uh, he, he, he probably have a, a presentation like that just to narrow down the scope. Otherwise, we'll be here for you know, half a day or something. Anyway, uh, I mean, without further ado, um, Ingo, it's yours. All right. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I will get back to sharing the screen. And here we go. So to start off, I'm going to give an introduction to the um, to the uh, definition of a dead country. I made it very broad. Um, I've got a total of about 40 slides um, to show um, things like former colonies. That's a pretty straightforward one. Former empires. I have only one of those uh, showing, but... Uh, there's lots of empires that issued their own uh, stamps that, you know, no longer exist. Um, provinces or states, I've got about eight of those, uh, which are I, uh, stamp issuing entities that now are part of a home country. Um, then there's a relatively broad category I use called former territories. It's something that I put in where you can exactly define it. Uh, in some cases, it could be a colony or, or other designation, but I just have a, a, that category of former territories. Uh, military occupation zones, getting Hong Kong mail to military occupation zones is an interesting challenge. Um, entities that change their name, that's pretty straightforward, and you can get a lot of very modern material like that as countries are changing their names uh, constantly still today. Uh, puppet states, that's, I just have one of those. And formerly amalgamated countries, countries that split up and became two or more different ones. And then formerly divided countries that were split up and then merged. So uh, I have a few examples of those. So without further ado, I will continue on to the first one. And that is... Um, colonies, former colonies. In this case, it's the Belgian colony of Belgian Congo. So this cover is a um, reading card sent in late October to um, a very, very remote place in the Belgian Congo. And um, it's the American Baptist Federation uh, Baptist um, Federation of Mission Services. So this is a, a missionary uh, correspondence, and uh, it's got a few interesting things. And in terms of in terms of um, captions, I'm not writing paragraphs of of uh, of words. I'm going to be talking about it. The only thing I show uh, is the rate and whatever feature there is that's worth noting but I will be talking to the pictures rather than uh, reading out paragraphs. So well, in this case, the interesting thing is the blue not open by sensor marking. That's a bit scarcer than the usual violet or sometimes black. And um, I studied the rooting of this and the, the internal rooting in um, Belgian Congo when it got there is very interesting. It would have gone from Leopoldville to um, a small town, which I can't read the name now. I think it's 
called Kick Congo that um, was very deep in the jungle and they had to go there by watercraft. But then for the final, for the final leg of the journey to Bundungu, it was by um, courier, by uh, a, a letter carrier who was just walking through the jungle. It's a really interesting routing when you get into it. So this is a, a nice cover going to a very exotic uh, final destination. Can can we ask questions as you're going on, Ingo, or you want to wait? Yes, the end? actually, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Feel free to jump in any time. I'm not making this a lecture. I want it to be a conversation. So if you have any observations or corrections or things to discuss, uh, feel free to jump in. I, I'm just curious about the not open by sensor. It's taped, so it was open sensor. So this, the boxed uh, hand stamp, must have been applied by some other sensor that along the way should have opened it but didn't. Is that is that what you think happened? The not the not opened by sensor is a Hong Kong marking. So when it left Hong Kong, they said, okay, it's a greeting card, it's a missionary, so we don't have to open it. But when it got to um, the Congo, um, this the sensor. The uh, sensors in Congo's decided, hey, we better check this thing. It's foreigners. Thank you. Yeah. Ingo, Ingo uh, silly questions from um, that blue, not owned by sensor marking. You quite often see that of mail sent through America from Hong Kong. And the on the back, the diamond shaped postmark. I think that's a British market. That's a London, yeah. So is it right that this this letter, which is the five cent, uh, five cent rate, um, went via America, which was common at that time, and then via the UK? Well, it definitely went via the UK, because you're right, that diamond uh, machine uh, marking is a UK marking. But you know what, I did not research which ship it departed on. And considering the length of time, I would say it probably did cross the United States, it would have gone from Hong Kong to San Francisco, or maybe Vancouver, and then crossed by train, uh, from West Coast to East Coast, and then got into London, and then sent southwards. Now, remember, this is 1941, so uh, this there's, almost, this I, I mean, this was almost yeah. the last mail to the USA. Yeah, maybe, because it's 16th of October. 19th, is it? November? The 16th or 19th? November. Uh, sorry, November. Yes, yeah, 16th yeah, of November. November. Yeah. It's very yeah. late. And I think yeah. virtually all, all mail going via the UK went via America then. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, anyway, sorry, well, sorry to digress. No, that's fine. I, I'm glad to learn about my covers. I don't know it all. <laughs> All right, moving on, uh, Aden. So Aden is a former British colony. Um, obviously now it's uh, part of the country of Yemen, which is a very troubled area. Uh, this is a 1936 airmail cover with the 35 cents per half ounce airmail rate. Um, it's, um, it seems to be an Indian trader, uh, trading company that mailed this. So it's a commercial item via Calcutta. And you have the arrival in Aden. I remember that uh, Duncan crew helped me with that one when I asked some uh, questions about it because I showed it at some other uh, event. But anyways, Aden is a, is a dead country uh, in the stamp world. Um, another British colony, former British colony, North Borneo. Um, it's uh, now, of course, the state of Sabah as part of Malaysia. And um, very, very vanilla, plain vanilla kind of cover, 50 cents per half ounce rate uh, to zone one. Um, 
nothing special about it except that it's uh, going to um, a fellow who works for the railways in Jesselton. Uh, here's one that's nice, uh, I would call it exotic, uh, going to a former Dutch colony, uh, the colony of Aruba. Um, these are still countries that are associated with the Netherlands, but they're not colonies anymore. They're, they have a, a designation that they're independent states that have an association with the Netherlands crown. Um, so they still speak Dutch there and they still have a, a, a strong affiliation with their home country, but technically they're not colonies anymore. So I've got Aruba here. Um, and of course, the franking is very interesting with five of the uh, provisional uh, revenue stamps. And it's a little bit philatelic. Somebody wrote on it first issue, five cents provisional. It's the first day of that um that uh that was put into effect when they had the shortage of five cent stamps and the other feature of this is that it's a Wan Chai branch cancellation which is always nice to get in the 1930s uh the next one is another dutch colony uh curacao um different correspondence but uh, same rate 25 cents this time paid with a single uh, george the fifth uh, definitive and uh, one of the nice features of this besides the destination is the uh, espleniform type n uh, cancellation um here is a interesting one because it's a branch post office airmail cover pre-war and i remember richard asking me for examples of pre pre-war pre-invasion um branch post office airmail covers and they're not they're scarce it's very hard to find ones that are not from uh, victoria or from from gpo so this is from shung in 1938 going to uh dutch east indies uh, dutch west yeah, Dutch East Indies. And again, there's that 35 cents per half ounce air mail rate. Um, one thing on the addressee, that uh, second line meuble maker, it uh, translates to furniture maker. So this is some kind of commercial correspondence going to a furniture maker. Former French colonies. So this is one to French Indochina. Um, French Indochina had a lot of different uh, provinces, some of which issued their own stamps. This is one for the entire country, which now, of course, is Vietnam. Uh, this one is uh, commercial mail from a shipping line. Uh, and it's, again, the printed matter rate. For some reason, when I was putting this together, I realized I have a lot of printed matter uh, covers. So this is, again, the five cents per two ounce rate and um, going to Haiphong up in North Vietnam. Uh, another French colony or former French colony was the Middle Congo. Now the Middle Congo was uh, part of something called uh, French East, French Equatorial Africa. And the bottom line on the address there, AEF, Afrique Equatoriale Francais, is uh, the uh, actual country, but they're the provinces or territories of French Equatorial Africa, most of them issued their own stamps, including an entity called Middle Congo or Moyen Congo. So this, is, this counts as a country from my definition of uh, an entity Entity that issued its own stamps. So um, what's even more interesting about this one besides the destination is that it's going to a gentleman with a number and it says travailleur chinois, meaning French work, uh, Chinese worker. So I looked up uh, what was going on in uh, middle Congo in that time. And of course the biggest industries there are forestry and mining. And it seems that uh, Chinese labor was imported to work the mines there. 
So this is a, a very exotic cover, thinking that uh, a guy working is getting some mail from his his relatives in uh, Hong Kong to see how he's doing. And also to tell me that these workers were literate. They got they got mail, so that means they could read theoretically. So uh, very interesting little piece of uh, history. There is a receiver marking. It's very faint, but uh, Point Noir is the port of what today is called uh, Congo Brazzaville or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, Macau. It's a former Portuguese colony, so it counts in this discussion as a as a dead country. Um, now, of course, Macau is a special administrative region of China, just like Hong Kong is. Uh, but in this era, now this is from my exhibit from 1945, um, uh, Hong Kong 1945. And this is uh, a first day of service resumption from uh, Hong Kong to Macau. The ferry service started on the 1st of October in 1945 as the co colony was reconstructing itself after the destruction of Japanese occupation. And uh, the big thing about this is the rate. It's a 20 times 8 cent rate. If you add up all those stamps, it comes out to $1.60. So that's a very heavy mailing. And it seems to be commercial. Um, so I've uh, had this in that exhibit and I've uh, I've sort of convinced judges that it's a commercial item, and I, I think it is. Bingo. The, yes. Oh, the, the last one, the Bella Vista Hotel is a very old uh, establishment. It's now the Portuguese embassy, I think. Um, I'm just, just uh, amusing. I, I've stayed there. I stayed there for a oh. few days um years ago and the staff were almost as old as the hotel would <laughs> seem to. and uh, the doors the door to uh, my room you had to use two hands to open it it, yeah. was, it was about 10 feet high yeah. <laughs> sorry i interrupt you again i apologize nice well if 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 the per personnel there was so old they might have handled this cover. <laughs> okay, another former Portuguese colony is Timor. That's a that's a pretty scarce destination to find. And um, I was lucky to get this a long time ago from a John Bull sale in the old days of John Bull when George was still around. And uh, this is a double censored item. Uh, it got censored in Hong Kong. 1940, and uh, then it got censored in uh, the Dutch East Indies with that gesensuriert uh, one marking. And um, it's consular mail. It went from the Consulate General of uh, Portugal in Hong Kong to Dili and to more. Uh, there is a receiver and a single rate, 25 cents per first ounce surface. Um, just a nice. Nice destination, nothing else that exciting about that cover. Okay, so now we're on to a former empire, and this is the Ottoman Empire. So this is 1910, when the Ottoman Empire, which had been in, around since the 1400s, uh, was on its last legs. World War II sort of was the death knell for the Ottoman Empire, which was based in what we now call Turkey. And it was very interesting to see the term Turkey used on this cover. Um, the stamp ish, stamps that were issued in Turkey at that time had the name Posts Ottomans or uh, Empire de Ottoman. So they had Ottoman Empire as their official country name. Uh, but here this uh, sender is using the term Turkey to get it to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, which is which was part of that empire, um, and um, it had it has so many markings. It really tells you the story of how that uh, four cent postcard got to Jerusalem 
via Colum first via Shanghai. It, it is originating in Shanghai, so theoretically, it's not actually a Hong Kong item, uh, but it's got the Hong Kong postal stationery, so we'll count it. Uh, but it's from Shanghai. It got from the British post office into the Chinese post office. And um, it got into um, Colombo it, it, and then to um, Egypt, Alexandria and Port Tariq. Uh, and then finally uh, by surface to Jerusalem. So uh, nice routing. Uh, I had the back translated. The back, you can't see too much of it there on the little small window, but it, it had really weird writing. It was all like um, chicken scratch writing. And I had a, a dear old friend of mine who is no longer with us, Michael Madesker, uh, help me translate it. And what it was, it was a, a form of Yiddish writing. And it's uh, Jewish uh, friends writing to each other. There was no interesting postal history in it. It was just a personal letter. But they were using that Yiddish style of writing. So that was an interesting thing to learn about it. And also, it's going to a post restant. So it was going to somebody who was going to collect it at the post office. And we'll, we'll never know what uh, how that thing was received and uh, how it got into the philatelic community. But... I'm glad I have it. Yeah, Ingo, may I add uh, something? Yeah, yeah. Go I ahead. Think, I think the, the 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 card actually posted at the uh, the Shanghai Chinese Post Office. If you look at the the date stamp, is the fourth of April on the on the uh, the Shanghai the Chinese Shanghai cancel and the BPO cancel. The Shanghai is fifth of April. So it's actually. Good. You know, actually, for what do you call it? Call it cash, cash card? I don't know. What do you call it? That's it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And also, yeah. I haven't ever been able to determine what this sort of upside down T marking is. It's not T. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. A, a Shanghai, maybe is. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But I, I've got a feeling that actually somebody posted at the, uh, the, the, the Shanghai Chinese post office. And it was taken to the British Post Office, um, uh, Shanghai Post Office, to be posted. But uh, in 1910, uh, I think uh, it, it, China, China is not quite a member of the UPU yet. So maybe that, that's how the way that the, the, the letters got out. Fine. Okay. Very good observation. You know what? I did not even notice that. But you're right. It's the 4th of April and the British Post Office is uh, 5th of April. What about the Shanghai chop on the left here? That's a different that I, one. I can't really see because it's, it's got two blobs. Uh, probably the same date as the, the other bilingual uh, Shanghai cancel. Maybe, maybe right. it's a branch or something. The okay. Chop. Yeah. And, right. and the, the bilingual chop is, is the head office chop. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Have to ask the Chinese Interesting. Chop. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, from empires, we move to provinces or states. So um, these are states or provinces that issued their own stamps before they became part of the mother country. And the first one I show is an Australian state, uh, that being Tasmania. Um, it's a picture postcard uh, of a scene from Shanghai. Um, and it's addressed to... Um, to uh, uh, a reverend in Ta in Launston, uh, Tasmania. And uh, it's got a sort of very personal, almost a love message, have not forgotten you today. Um, but what's curious is that it has a Butterfield and Swire perfin on it. So it's private use of a perfin. And you do see these around. Um, and uh, that makes it a little bit more interesting than uh, normal. But um, Anyways, it's it's definitely a rare destination because mail to Australia is not all that scarce, uh, but to some of the uh, outlying areas, uh, that's a little bit different. It's also one thing that I, I came across a lot of these a lot of these covers that I'm showing. When I purchased these, it would be advertised as Hong Kong to Australia, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I have a few other examples where it's Hong Kong to the mother country. But when you study the um, details of the address, you realize it's going to a place that was a stamp issuing entity. So the destination can be considered that stamp issuing entity and makes it a more scarce mm -hmm. one. And um, so here we have uh, the province of Newfoundland, which only joined Canada in 1949. Up until 1949, Newfoundland was a dominion of the British Empire. And so in 1937, when this uh, letter was mailed, it was still a, uh, its own uh, stamp issuing entity. Newfoundland has some very, very beautiful uh, stamp designs. They were very loyal to the crown and they always had uh, nice pictorial issues and nice royal family issues. And um, they even issued the first image of uh, our late Queen Elizabeth uh, in 1936. They issued a, a, a stamp with her picture as a baby. But anyways, this uh, cover is going to um, St. George's, Newfoundland, which is on the uh, west side of Newfoundland, it's a tiny little fishing village. Most of the little towns in Newfoundland are fishing villages. And a famous guy named Reverend Butler. He was a churchman, but he was also a stamp dealer, a stamp collector and a, and a worldwide dealer. And there's a lot of mail going to and from uh, Reverend Butler. So it's, it's, a, it's a big correspondence. Um, so it is it is exotic to get a cover from Hong Kong to Newfoundland, but um, it's not exactly uh, you know fully commercial. You can you can sort of consider it somewhat philatelic, uh, but it's genuinely passed through the post office. And this thing has a little bit of an interest on the uh, cancellation. The Type M uh, is dated twenty seventh of August, nineteen thirty seven. And I looked that up in uh, Web and Proud, and both of them show the latest date being uh, something in April 1937. So uh, that was a nice thing to discover about this. I, I also like how simply addressed it is. You know, very simple address. Uh, it, it's obviously a small town and every new Reverend Butler and didn't need much of an, uh, much of an address. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And in most of those little fishing villages uh, in uh, Newfoundland, you just needed a name because everybody knew everybody else. Uh, another Canadian province uh, is Nova Scotia. And, and uh, for those of you who don't know your Canadian history, the provinces of Canada that started the country were... were Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, and British Columbia and Vancouver. And those provinces all issued their own stamps in the 1860s and uh, up until about the 70s. So those are definitely stamp issuing entities. Now finding Hong Kong mail from that early era, the 1860s, is extremely scarce. And I don't have any of that. But I do have Victorian mail to um, Nova Scotia in this cover. A very straightforward, four cents per half ounce rate. Uh, fortunately, there's a uh, paid all San Francisco marking on the back. So we were able to find out the routing. And it would have crossed uh, America to the East Coast by rail and then uh, gotten to uh, Nova Scotia, probably by ship from uh, either Boston or New York. Um, another one, this is a, lot, a much scarcer one. Prince Edward Island is another one of those Canadian provinces that issued its own stamps in the Victorian era. It's a much smaller uh, colony and smaller uh, population. So Getting mail to a place like Prince Edward Island is very, very uh, exotic. Um, it's it, this is earlier. This is 1885, and it's the um, 10 cent per half ounce rate before they lowered the rates uh, as they did for that Nova Scotia cover in the 191890s. Um, it does have uh, some good receiver markings, including when it arrived in Charlottetown 
and it was about a two month journey for the whole thing. I, I didn't outline the the details, but this was a really really nice find, and I have to thank my friend uh, Lee Scamp for making this one available to me. <laughs> Very nice. Um, here's another one of those that was advertised as a cover to Germany, and uh, because it has a couple of faults in it with those filing holes, it came to me very cheaply. But if you see that it went to a town of Coburg in the in the state of Bavaria, and in 1922, Bavaria was still its own country with its own king issuing its own stamps. So again, a, a cover that's advertised in the um, philatelic uh, world as going to Germany, it's actually a very exotic destination of Bavaria. Uh, I mean, it's not that exotic. There is a lot of mail to places like Munich, which is the capital of Bavaria, but still it is a, it is a dead country. Uh, this is one of those going to this uh, a province of Indochina that also for a brief time issued its own stamps, uh, that being Cochin, China, which is a southern part of uh, Vietnam. Um, uh, Saigon is, is uh, the capital of what used to be called Cochin, China. Uh, it's a five cent, uh, sorry, 25 cent uh, surface letter, 16th of August, 1941. Uh, going to the captain of the golf club of Saigon in Indochina. So uh, still playing golf uh, in 1941, even though the golf would be over very shortly. Uh, okay, this is one of my, my best finds. This again was one of those where it said, um, Hong Kong postcard to Mozambique. And I thought, oh, great, that's a nice destination. But it's better than that. It's the province of Quelimane in Mozambique. And those of you who per peruse worldwide catalogs, when I, when I started collecting stamps, one of the best educations I got was just taking a catalog and paging through it, uh, looking at all the strange countries and all the stamps they issued. And I always found, OK, there's not a lot of cues. And Quella Mane is one of the few Q countries. And it was a colony of Portugal before they amalgamated all the provinces into an entity called Mozambique. And there are stamps issued with the name Quella Mane on it. So it's a dead country by my definition. And uh, that made that cover a lot more valuable to me personally. And um, it's also got some uh, beautiful uh, picture of a Chinese orchestra. It's, it's a really lovely piece. And uh, so that's one, one hint to uh, pay attention to the details of a cover when they um, say it's going somewhere and see where it's really going to. This is one of my favorite covers. I've shown it at a lot of different places, a lot of different times. It's going to the Indian uh, princely state of Bahawalpur. Uh, I say Indian because at the time of this mailing in the 1930s, it was part of the uh, Indian uh, uh, empire. Um, but of course, it's in the western part of India that after partition became Pakistan. And Baha Walper is uh, a uh, stamp issuing entity for a very short time after World War II and after partition. They still stayed independent and had um, their own stamps. They had an, a UPU issue, UPU centenary issue, and uh, some definitives. They had some very scarce overprints. And... Um, it's uh, it's a going uh, place. I mean, I, I studied the geography of it and the history of it when I analyzed this cover. Uh, but what's really interesting is the um, consignee, the addressee. If you look at the long-winded name, these are all the titles of the ruler of uh, Baha Walper at the time, uh, Mr. Khan. Nawab of Baha Walpur. Nawab is the uh, name for prince or ruler. 
uh, and it's addressed to the palace Baha Walpur. So it's a really, really cool cover going to uh, uh, a guy who's running a country. And I studied him. I, I, I checked him out on, on online, on Wikipedia and other sources. And he was a very educated fellow. He studied in uh, England and uh, was a very benef uh, benevolent dictator of his country. And his family still exists. He died in the, um, I think, in the 1960s. <coughs> Excuse me. He died in the 1960s, but his family is still amongst the ruling class of Bao Walper today and very prominent citizens. So um, the other nice part of this, it's another Wan Chai branch uh, cover from the 1930s. And for some reason, it's a very large cover. It's an oversized uh, uh, cover, uh, but it's four cents and uh, per two ounces. And then you just got to wonder, what was the St. John Ambulance Brigade of Hong Kong uh, sending to the ruler of uh, a princely state in uh, India? Just uh, a lot of little bit of mystery there. This one I have to say thank you to my dear friend uh, Michel Hood. It's uh, a cover going to a former territory, and that's what we're into now is former territories. Uh, this is the territory of Heligoland, uh, which uh, at various times was a British um, sphere of influence and issued stamps uh, that are considered part of uh, the British um, area. Uh, but really, it's just an island not far off the coast of uh, northern Germany near Hamburg or uh, the port of Wilhelmshaven. And uh, this is a postcard that went to a sailor who uh, was uh, on a ship that, although the postcard is addressed to Wilhelmshaven, he was on a ship that was in Heligoland. And you see the Heligoland receiver there showing that this, this is where it went. So that's an extremely exotic place. I don't know of any other correspondence that ever reached Heligoland from Hong Kong. And it's the four cents uh, rate uh, of 1895. I have an earlier one that was the three cents rate. Uh, yeah, and then so another thing that I designate as a territory is the uh, German colony of Kauchu. Again, this was uh, listed in an auction as uh, mail to China, Hong Kong to China. Well, yes, it is going to China. But it's going to Qingdao, which was at that time part of Kaochu, which was a German sphere of influence, or, or you could call it a treaty port. And um, that is the destination, as far as I'm concerned, and it's a dead country. So again, I got this relatively reasonably, but uh, actually I think it's worth more because of the, the uh, exo exotic nature of the destination. Uh, yeah, here's another one of the former territories in Germany, uh, Marienwerder. And this is another one that I would have never known about had I not, as a youth, paged through the pages of a catalog and found names like Alawites and uh, Tanutuva and Marienwerder, which is actually a city in Poland nowadays. Um, what happened was after World War I, they had a plebiscite in different parts of Poland because there was a lot of Germans settled there, including my parents and grandparents. And in the city of Marienwerder, they had a plebiscite to say, do you want to stay part of Germany or do you want to become Polish? And um, during that time, Marienwerder issued stamps. They were the Germania German over stamps overprinted with Marienwerder plebiscite. So for a very brief time, a couple of years, Marion Werder issued its own stamps. And this is an 1894 cover, obviously, with the um, old three cent rate and uh, going to a city that would one day become a stamp issuing entity. So again, it's, it's my definition of these things is kind of broad, but uh, 
still an exotic uh, place to uh, find mail from Hong Kong. I have to excuse myself. I'm, I'm just coming off a cold, so I'm coughing a lot here. <coughs> So next we have a former territory. Um, again, this is something with my broad definition of a territory. It could be uh, construed as a colony, uh, but because it's actually three countries, uh, I call it a territory. So it's a, a KUT, um, nice cover going with the um, 45 cent rate made up of 20 cents first down surface. 25 cents registration. Um, but there is a big curiosity to me here, and I haven't been able to figure it out. I've asked some of my Indian fellows uh, to help with the rooting of this because you see the receiver, Dar es Salaam, 28th of December, 1941. But that transit marking of Madura, I looked up where Madura is in India. And it's in the center part of southern India, probably a couple of hundred miles inland from uh, uh, Madras. So how did a cover go into the center of southern India when it was on its way from Hong Kong to Dar es Salaam? Complete mystery. I have no idea. And like, it could have gone via Madras, or which usually they'd get Madras uh, transit markings, or there's another a uh, smaller port, which name just escapes me, which it could have been, uh, or but for some reason, this thing ended up inland in India, maybe a misrooting of a bag or something, but very strange uh, place for this thing to have been. Could have been missing. Do they have an airport there? Well, they do now, but uh, in 1941, I, I don't know. Okay. Because it wasn't an airmail. I mean, it was a surface uh, surface cover. Yeah. So maybe just it might have been. Yeah. It might have been being sent across India to Bombay, and then from Bombay to uh, East Africa. A shipping route did go that way. Ah, okay. I never thought of that. So on its way through, somebody in that town, uh, maybe they switched a rail car or some some bags yeah. of postage yeah. and. Got the uh, stamp on it there. Okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you, Duncan. Can't, can't, can't help you with that, but just as an aside, Tanganyika is in any case a dead country in its own right. It's now, of course, yes. only part of Tanzania. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that is a very complicated uh, entity. You've got Kenya. You've got Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, combined with Zanzibar. Uh, they had originally they were British East Africa Company. I mean, it's a really you can have a lot of fun with that one as a, as dead countries. Um, Palestine that was a British mandated territory after World War One, and um, so. You know, I, again, I, I consider it a territory. Of course, there could be a lot of uh, political discourse about the state of Palestine. Uh, but in 1941, uh, when this was mailed, um, going to Jerusalem, um, it got censored at Hong Kong, and then it got also censored on arrival. Here you have a little uh, Jerusalem censor. And... Um, it pays the uh, 15 cent surface rate. And um, I, at first I thought it was uh, an all up, but it, it's, it's not, it can't be because of the uh, date. It's gotta be a surface. Um, canal zone. Now this is a territory that it sounds very exotic, but actually there's, I've seen numerous covers going to the canal zone. And I guess it's because of the shipping connection and a lot of commerce going through there. Um, it was a territory of the United States who helped build that canal and they sort of took the uh, several miles on each side of the canal as, as American territory for the purposes of 
building and then administering the canal. Um, but mail would go through the um, Panama uh, mail system. You see a receiver here November 13th and November 14th that gets into the American mail system in Cristobal uh, Canal Zone. Uh, the reason I say this is somewhat um, common is because I've seen more of this correspondence on offer in different auctions. So this is a famous correspondence. Uh, and I've seen other ones going to Canal Zone, but still it is a relatively unusual one. Now, this one I had a lot of trouble rating, 48 cents. It's for that time, um, it would have been 20 cents, um, 20 cents postage going there, but it's, it's 48. And so how do you get to that with the um, registration fee of 20 cents? And the only way I could figure it out was that it would be sent as commercial papers. And it's a large envelope that could have had commercial papers in it, heavy ones. And it's also very thick paper. And then that would be with um, uh, four extra ounces to make it as a, a double rate letter of that 20 cents per first 10 ounces to come up to 28 cents and then the 20 cent registration fee to make 48. That was the only way I could get to that rate. But if somebody has better rate knowledge, feel free to correct me. Uh, very straightforward territory, the territory of Hawaii, which is now, of course, one of the states of the United States since 1959. Um, Hawaii had an interesting uh, uh, postal history. For a short time around World War II, there was a special rate to Hawaii um, because the transit, it was part of the Trans-Pacific route, and um, Lee Scamp postulated that there was a special Hawaii rate and he has some covers to show evidence. I don't have any of those here, but um, anyways, Hawaii is uh, can be considered a dead country because there were also Hawaiian stamps issued uh, in the early 1900s with the queen, queen of Hawaii shown as an image. And of course the very famous Hawaiian uh, provisional uh, postmaster stamps, which are extremely uh, high, high end, valuable, uh, desirable things to collect. Um, okay, now we're on to military occupation zones. I've got two of these. And the first one is uh, one of my favorite finds uh, for this kind of uh, uh, entity. Uh, Rhodes, the Middle Eastern Forces, MEF Dodecanese, which is uh, the island of Rhodes just off the coast of Turkey and the Aegean, Southern Aegean Sea. Um, and it took me a while to figure out where all this stuff was, but this cancel in the lower, in the upper right here is the, the Rhodes receiver and gives you the date of when it got there it went via Cairo. Cairo would have been the exchange office for this. Um, and uh, 1946, uh, going by air to the office of exchange of Cairo. Uh, one th that's how it got the $1.30 airmail rate and uh, plus the 25 cent imprint going there. Um, so, of course, Germany after World War II was divided into different occupation zones, the French, the Russian, the American, and the British. And this one uh, is going to the British zone, uh, again, with a Juska uh, feature, uh, this one going by airmail to the office of exchange only, and uh, at the 130 rate. And they, specif they specify province of Hanover, Germany British zone so it is uh, it is uh, going to uh, an issue that issue an entity that issued its own stamps and um, I consider this a uh, destination cover not to Germany but to Germany comma British zone 
and um, it's it's a well known correspondent, a, a Dr. Voss. I have a lot of uh, mail from from or to him. Uh, he, he was all over the country. There's a lot of different addresses for Dr. Voss, and he has some very interesting postal history addressed to him. Interestingly, the uh, the obliterating marks that should have gone over the airmail label went over the stamps for some reason. Okay, now we come to about eight slides of countries that changed their names. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, so Basuto land, uh, which, which I discovered from looking through all the British colonies in the catalog, is a little landlocked country in southern Africa. Uh, um, and now it's, of course, the country of Lesotho. Um, printed matter, another one, 15 cent of the uh, Elizabethan uh, wilding era, 1961. Uh, again, and the, you see that it says Basuda Land, South Africa. So when I bought this, I mean, it's not that expensive a cover, even with the destination of Basuda Land, but it was listed as Hong Kong to South Africa. So again, it really pays to look at uh, the covers that you're that you're buying. Uh, here's a, a favored one. Uh, this is a very early acquisition when I was beginning to get interested in Hong Kong postal history. I picked this one up also from dear old uh, George from John Bull. And uh, I don't know how much I paid for it, but it wasn't much. It was, it, it seemed like, oh, it's a two cent, you know, whatever. But this is a really scarce rate and going to a scarce destination uh, a country that, of course, now is called Myanmar, and um, and it's got that censorship in Rangoon, uh, Hong Kong Weekly Press. It's a wrapper, not a not a cover, and um, that to me makes it a a, a very nice uh, piece, and uh, very glad to have this in, in my memory of uh, of George from John Bull. Uh, Ceylon is, of course, now Sri Lanka. I have a 1905 uh, postcard. A young lady is uh, getting a postcard from a traveler. And uh, that name, Bagawan Salawa, is, uh, is, uh, is an exotic sounding name itself. And it does have uh, the Bagawan Salana uh, oh. rival marking. So uh, nice. Just uh, nothing too exciting about it, but just nice routing shown on from Hong Kong to Colombo to uh, final destination. And of course, your classic uh, junk scene. Uh, this one, uh, I have to say thank you publicly to Duncan Crew for helping me with it. It's part of a essay that I wrote for the Philatelic Specialist Society of Canada. We uh, put out a, or we're in the process of publishing a book, um, an anthology of articles on aerophilately. And I don't consider myself an aerophilatelist by any means, but you, you can write an article on aerophilately if the definition is broad enough, if you have a lot of airmail material. So I did an article on Juska markings uh, for that uh, anthology which is going to come out by the end of this year i believe michelle also contributed to that if i'm not mistaken but uh anyway so this cover what i needed help on was the rate um the jusca marking is a nice early one by air dot 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 only and uh the handwritten uh, uh exchange office is kano in northern nigeria uh, it's addressed to gold coast and um, I was looking up the rates in uh, Duncan's book and could not find anything for that destination. There were rates listed for Eastern Africa, like Kenya, KUT, and, and, and also South Africa and Rhodesia, but nothing for West Africa. So I corresponded with Duncan, and uh, he said he had the same rate on a cover of that period going to the Gambia. And... Uh, 
and there are some, I think, known to uh, Nigeria itself. And this one, which sort of now by cover evidence proves that that $1.50 rate, even though it's not listed in any guide that we could find, uh, applies to Western Africa as well as Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, anything else you want to add to that, uh, Duncan? Okay. Anyways, uh, very can interesting I, rooting. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Can I just say, is that um, actually gone by the, if it's by air to Kano, presumably it's gone via the, the, the branch route, the West African branch, as well as both the main lines of the Imperial Airways. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember that um, it went it went to uh, Cairo, and then down to uh, what was the city in in Sudan, and I think from that Sudanese yeah Khartoum, I think it was oh, then diverted to the branch. Khartoum was the uh, sort of terminal point for West African Mail joining the main route. So it would be to Khartoum and then it flies from Khartoum into uh, Nigeria. Yeah. Anyways, Gold Coast is definitely a place I haven't seen a lot of covers to, so I'm really happy to have this one. Uh, another entity that changed its name is Nyasaland, which is now Malawi. And um, I was really happy to have this one, but I'm sort of thinking it's also got a little bit of philatelic element to it. It's the first day of the all up uh, scheme, 1st of September, 1938. And um, they're saying it, it's the first flight and the first day cover for, for that. So it could be a stamp collector sending it to his buddy, but I'm glad his buddy was in Nyasaland because I don't have any other Nyasaland covers. Uh, Straight Settlements was a country name. And uh, of course there was three different ones, uh, Malacca, Singapore, and Penang. So I just picked the Penang one as an example of a country that used to be called Straight Settlements and is now uh, of course, Malaysia. Very straightforward rate, 40 cents, half ounce by air throughout in 1951. And uh, so the uh, another country that changed its name and has some interesting uh, history is Transjordan. It's now the full official name is the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or just Jordan itself. Um, this one, I also had a little bit of challenge to figure out the rate because that location isn't listed in the tables in um, in uh, Nick Halewood's book. Uh, they have Palestine and they have um, uh, Lebanon, but they don't have uh, Transjordan or, or, or that area. So I applied the Palestine rate to figure out the Two dollars and ten cents, because that was the only way I could get it to work. So sixty cents per half ounce, triple weight by air throughout, and then thirty cent registration fee. That was the only way I could get to two dollars and ten cents for that franking. Uh, the AV two marking is the most common one. It's still a nice one, but uh, I was all excited when I got that. But my uh, friend Murray Heifetz, uh, who's a specialist in those things and wrote books on it, uh, the late Murray Heifetz, uh, looked at that cover and said, oh yeah, that's the most common one of the AVs. But anyway, still nice. It's got also multiple censorship. Um, going to that part of the world in 1949, the geopolitical situation was that the state of Israel was being born and there was all kinds of war and um, getting letters into those territories was was uh, a challenge because some countries 
would not accept something if it was if it had to transit through Israeli territory. This one just uh, went through Egypt, so there was no problem. It's from a correspondence. I have more of these covers going to Mr. George Malki in Amman, uh, but this one had the best rate in that AV2 marking. So, but I have some other ones on this. Um, a very modern one, the country of Zaire, which now is called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a very troubled area with uh, all kinds of uh, terrible things happening to civilians there as they fight over natural resources in the eastern region of the country. Uh, this one is going to UNICEF and it's the uh, $3.10 rate. Uh, it's a nice late Hong Kong uh, prior to handover cover from 15th of February 97. And it shows a receiver of 3rd of uh, March 97 going to Kinshasa, which is the capital of Zaire. And also uh, it's got the stamp exhibition slogan. Yeah. Yeah. I was just yeah. going to point that out. Uh, neat. Yeah. Yeah. Nice clean cover. Very modern, but uh, still it fits my category of uh, dead countries. Is that the phosphor issue with the fossil lines? You know what? I have not checked that. Ah, okay. Which one would it be? Both of them? The 210 and the both one? Of them. Or just. Both of them. Yeah. Okay, I'll check that. I, You know what? I should have done that, but. Uh, the fossil okay. line actually is. Uh, oh, okay, you get a huge volume of mail at that time. But, you know, not many people have to save these covers because they're so modern. Uh, but right. The time finding the phosphor, the, the stamps with the phosphor lines are quite, uh, quite, quite difficult because it's only. We'll check that immediately. Yeah. yeah. Good, good observation. Thank you. All right, we're coming to the end. We're at puppet states, and of course, the Japanese took over a large territory of northern China. Um, Manchuria, etc., and called it Manchukuo and made it into a little empire with a puppet uh, dictator, uh, the former um, emperor of China. And um, it, this is a postcard. I have two, two covers going to Manchukuo. Uh, this is a postcard with a two cent rate, which is a published rate for postcards to China at the time. And um, it's uh, written in Russian, going to a young lady. I'm not sure if she was young or old, but it says Miss. And uh, in Harbin, which is, of course, a, a large uh, northern Chinese city. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah, the, the image on the postcard, I didn't show it because it's a night view real photo and all you see is darkness and a little string of lights along the uh, harbor side so there's not much to see uh, but still a two cent uh, postcard is nice nice kind of rate yes, very nice. and very yeah yeah and now we get to uh, the last three slides so formerly amalgamated countries so this is a cover going to czechoslovakia that in itself is not that exotic a destination. There's a lot of mail to Czechoslovakia, even in the George VI era. Um, Czechoslovakia was a country that was formed after World War I, and uh, they issued their own stamps starting in 1918 or 19 or so or 20. Um, but uh, in the 1990s, uh, the two ethnic groups in the country decided, you know what, we don't want to be a country anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And uh, so now it's the Czech Republic, otherwise known as Czechia, uh, and Slovakia, which is its own country. So um, that's one way of designating that. Uh, Rate-wise, nothing exciting, $1.50 uh, per half ounce by air throughout. And uh, third 30 cent registration. And then uh, this one is a little bit more exotic. The formerly amalgamated country called the United Arab Republic. 
uh, again, something that I found by paging through my catalog in my youth and thinking, what is the United Arab Republic? Um, and what it was, was uh, in the 1950s, Egypt and Syria decided we are going to merge our two countries completely, government, politically, uh, economically, we're going to become one country and we will inspire the rest of the Arab world to join us and we'll have one large United Arab Republic that surrounds Israel and drives the Jews into the sea. That was the, um, the basis of, of those two countries coming together. Well, it lasted for about 10 years as, as a political entity and they issued a lot of stamps with the initials UAR or sometimes United Arab Republic written out. Um, sometimes they would say UAR Egypt or UAR Syria, and sometimes they just said UAR, but it was a political entity. The only thing is the Arabs don't get along that well, and within 10 years there was a lot of infighting and, and recriminations, and uh, it didn't last very long. And certainly none of the other Arab countries uh, jumped on board to join it. So uh, it disappeared and uh, they kept issuing stamps for another 10 years. I think UAR stamps go into the late 60s, even though that was no longer a political entity. And um, so I got this cover going to Aleppo, which is in Syria. It's American consular mail, uh, personal mail between members of the American consulate in Hong Kong to the American consulate general in uh, in Aleppo, United Arab Republic. So very modern, but a, a country that no longer exists and only existed for about 10 years. And finally, I have uh, something called formerly divided countries. So we all know that after World War II, Germany, eventually after the occupation zones were, uh, were disbanded, became two countries, one of them being the Federal Republic of Germany, which used to be called West Germany, and the German Democratic Republic, or Deutsche Demokratische Republik, which is DDR, uh, or otherwise known as East Germany. And for many years until 1990, they were two separate stamp issuing entities. And so I have this uh, 1956 cover it's probably being sent to a stamp collector because they put a bunch of stamps on it, uh, but it does add up to a dollar thirty cents for the uh, zone two rate. And uh, of course, in 1990, Germany reunified, and there's no more DDR and no more stamps from DDR, so it's a dead country. Mm -hmm. With that, I close my talk and say thank you for listening. Super. Super, thank you very much. I think it's uh, really, uh, you deserve a round of applause, you know, for our members, uh, really an eye opener to see so many exotic, well, I see some of them are so exotic that I've never seen before. And, um, oh, and um, yes, a anybody would like to ask any questions before we go on to the next uh, presentation? Okay, uh, I think we are all the... so excited. <laughs> I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, really, yeah, enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, it's it's a big variety. It's it's modern. It's ancient. It's it's every era, every ever, and it covers a yeah. lot of the different yeah. collecting areas: registration, airmail. Um, you know, it's it really yeah. treaty yeah. ports. It really covers a lot of different areas. So it's not specialized in this classical sense, but it's a kind of fun way to collect uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, and your narrative. I mean, you know, you, you have obviously done a lot of research uh, uh, into each cover, uh, which uh, absolutely admire that. It is uh, fantastic. So thank you very uh, much, Ingo, and uh, yes. we look forward uh, to see another of your presentations yes. in the future. Uh, I'm sure which you have lots of things in mind. Uh, for yeah, us. ask Ingo a question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I enjoy yes. your talk. And but have you estimate how many dead countries have you not covered? Well, I know how many dead countries. Okay, my my personal collection. I have. I have about um, eighty dead countries in by those definitions. I have I have a database of my my destination covers, and I have two hundred and twenty. Oh, really? Two hundred twenty different de de destinations, and about eighty of them are dead countries. Oh. But um, if you but that's not a lot because mm. I I there's a group in Chicago the Chicago Collectors Club had a a publication that showed all the stamp issuing entities of all time in the world mm. counting like the old German states and uh, the, you know all the different it's six hundred wow. so for me to say I have Hong Kong mailed to two hundred different countries. Yes. I'm only one third of the way there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Well, some countries will probably never find mail uh, from Hong Kong anyway. So yeah. uh, no, you you haven't yeah. done bad. You haven't done bad. Yeah. You probably covered most of it anyway. So uh, really yeah. well done. Very right, well done. Okay. If anybody uh, finds Hong Kong to Tanutuva, oh. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Okay. So um, I think uh, Richard has got a few things to share, haven't you, Richard? Uh, yes. First of all, yeah. let's say uh, thank you to Ringo. That was a cool concept, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So let me uh, share my screen and see what we got here. So I, I rummaged around. I promised I would do something for uh, for uh, Andrew, and uh, this is what it is. It has a, It does have a connection with. Um, so can everybody see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally, totally different subject. Um, it's the first, it's the precursors to uh, Trans Siberia Railway work, and also uh, the first phase where mail was sent from uh, Hong Kong through to Europe via Trans Siberia. Anyway, let's start at the beginning. I think the, the connection to uh, Ingo's uh, presentation that this is a postcard to, also to a dead country, England. <laughs> uh, one and a half hours ago, our 45 day old prime minister resigned. Oh. So uh, perhaps you, you uh, oh. busy here, but... Uh, uh, more. Is that the record? I'm not sure. To be oh, honest. Prime Minister. Okay. You mean the lettuce her? Sorry. The lettuce outlasted her. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the best description I heard was that David Bain spent more time inside a box. <laughs> The illusionist. Looks like King Charles is going to have his first new prime minister uh, to uh, designate. Indeed, indeed. Anyway, this, this, I bought this. Uh, bit, everything is from my rather small collection, but I bought this one in an auction here, and I was attracted by the handwritten note. It's sent from the uh, Russian post office in Chifu via Siberia uh, in the Russian postmark is 1st of September 1902. And the guy who sent it, Mr. John Shettle, 
was actually the clerk to the naval commodore secretary in Hong Kong. And um, this is well, uh, over a year before the uh, first mails went from uh, Hong Kong via this route. And it was even before the China Eastern Railway, which connected Harbin, uh, which was the link into the main uh, Trans-Siberian East-West Line through uh, Russia, uh, that hadn't been fully built yet. The northern section had been um, and had been repaired by this time after the Boxer Rebellion that blew it to pieces. So this was an interesting thing for me. And then about half an hour before this meeting, I was looking at something and I noticed this, which was in the London and China Express in October 1902. And it is said here that uh, a naval officer from writing from Wei Hai Wei said that there was a new uh, service by a Siberian, but letters with Russian stamps, blah, blah. And the letter that this newspaper quoted was postmarked Chifu September 1 and delivered to Kent on the 30th of September. And there's another letter from Wei Hai Wei, uh, also sent via Chifu. So they're interesting. And the, with ten, they were both at 10 kopecks. Um, with if we go back to this one, then this one is also Chifu, the first of September 1902, but through to Suffolk. Um, has the 10 kopeck um, stamp on it. Actually, postcards could be sent by uh, five kopecks, then mm. I think. Um, but my guess is that nobody knew very much about what the rates were and all this kind of thing, and they just stuck 10 kopeck stamps on everything. Mm. So that's the precursor which I picked up quite recently, which I need to look into much further, as mentioned at the bottom. Now, turning to the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railway to the British Post Office mails, um, then various uh, papers stated various things, uh, two from uh, Shanghai, uh, where on the 6th of November, there was no service, as we see on the right top, and on the left top by the 13th, it was open, and uh, at the bottom is from the Daily Press in Hong Kong on the 9th of November saying that uh, mails were done. The Postmaster General uh, confirmed that the first mail out of Hong Kong via that route was on the 10th of November. I've actually uh, written on this before, but that's how I won't deal with this. This actually, this scrappy little number actually is a first day cover uh, that went uh, on the first mail out of Hong Kong through the British Post Office system on the Trans-Siberian Railway. It went on the steamer Ningbo and uh, the details are there. And in uh, Shanghai, uh, it was transferred from the British Post Office through into the China Eastern Railway Company uh, for their steamer Manchuria. And that left Shanghai for Downey, uh, which was the port, end port of the China Eastern Railway uh, on Sunday the 22nd. And from down it went by train uh, on that railway to Harbin and then transferred westbound to Berlin. And I think it went, then went to Hamburg and then onward by sea to England, arriving in London 
on the 14th of December 1903. So 22 days from Shanghai, which was quite amazing at that time. Now, I have a few other early ones. Uh, letters were sent basically by every available steamer to Shanghai, and then they were sorted in the Shanghai Post Office and forwarded via the trans -Hiberian. This one's a 471, the 28th of November, and this one departed on the 29th of November, the following day, uh, on the Russian steamer Amor. This was actually the second mail. This one was not to a dead country. This one's to Germany. Um, and this one came from Hong Kong on 7th of December, uh, Shanghai the 12th. And it went by either the of two steamers, probably um, the Wuhu steamer, uh, China navigation steamer. And it then departed on the 13th, again on the Amo. Mail for Germany was uh, sent through to a traveling post office, which is number 8018 on the train between Alexandrova and Berlin where mails were sorted into the different countries there, they weren't enclosed back to that traveling post office. This one, another one to England, on the 30th of January. The postmark is not clear on the adhesive, but uh, you can see the 30 and uh, ties in with the uh, message. Geisha girls were very popular as uh, postcards in those days. And this one departed Shanghai on the Argon, which was another China Eastern Railway Company steamer. And then onward through by the same route as I previously mentioned. And this one, which I thought it was quite a lot of money a long time ago, but probably not anymore. This is a postcard sent from Hong Kong on the 27th of January, 1904. And it has uh, Shanghai Transit. And it was redirected from Germany uh, through to Switzerland arrived there on the 4th of March. And this was carried by a Jardine steamer, Athenian. It arrived on a Saturday, but in fact, the Shanghai British Post Office only handled it on the Monday. So it missed one of the steamers that departed on the Sunday. But lucky for me, it then went on the steamer Mongolia, which left on the 7th of February, and this was the final mail to leave Shanghai for onward transmission by the Trans-Siberian Mail Route before its closure due to the Russo-Japanese War. In fact, the Mongolia was thought to have been lost, but it achieved its schedule to Dalny uh, on time. Again, uh, for Switzerland, mails were sent through to the travelling post office number 81, and uh, that's it. So this was, I think, I don't, I haven't, don't think I've ever seen another one by this route at the latest of the last mail. And here's just uh, one or two notices, um, which were a little bit after the event on the 11th and 12th of February. Uh, saying that no more mail will be sent via Siberia. And the bottom right one is a confirmation that the mails that had been sent had uh, got through. Um, 
for anybody who's interested. I just put this in. Um, these are all these are the sailings from Shanghai to Downey uh, on Chinese Eastern Railway Company steamers. Uh, but these are the ones that with British Post Office mails from Shanghai and uh, Hong Kong um, for connection uh, through Harbin for uh, Europe. Sailing number one uh, did not have uh, Hong Kong mails sent through the British Post Office, but from two through to 13, uh, they did. They sailed on Sundays, and then the mails closed at 6 p.m. on the day before. So that's about it. Mm. Okay, Richard, in, in one of your slides, um, you, you also mentioned that uh, there was a uh, there was a line running between Shanghai and Vladivostok as well. So has that yeah. uh, got any role in carrying the uh, the, 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 the Trans-Siberian Railway, uh, uh, by the Trans-Siberian yeah. Railway route? Yes, it does. Uh, the, the, mail, the main mails uh, were sent via these Russian steamers between Shanghai and Down, yeah. or later Darien and, and so on. But they weren't the only mails that were made up. Other mails were made up in the Shanghai post office that went via uh, Vladivostok, even in, the, even in the first period. Of course, when it reopened in 1907, then all, the, all of the mails went through Vladivostok for quite considerable time. Uh, but there are also mails sent through to Vladivostok for connection uh, from Shanghai in the first period. We, we, we actually, um, some time ago, maybe a, at least a year ago, we actually discussed uh, a, an interesting thing about the, uh, the, the postcard rate, uh, which you said it was uh, a five copeck for a postcard. Um, and I said, no, there are some postcards with frank four copeck. Um, yes. I've actually, since then, I've actually made some observations, and um, uh, in fact, you are you are you are right because in the, in the early period, actually, certainly within the 0203 and before the closure uh, of of the railway, or put the the correct rate uh, was five copeck. In fact, the Russian uh, in 1899 actually issued the five copeck stamp for the, for this purpose. Uh, yes. However, after the uh, reopening of the, uh, uh, the, the the railway, after after the, uh, the finishing of the uh, the, the, the uh, Russell Japanese War, um, I think that the rate actually reverted to four kilobytes. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. so yes, well, I remember that. that. I remember well. that comment. No, I remember thanks, that. thanks for sticking to the five copeck rate, which, which I thought initially, I mean, many years ago, I thought it was just an open prank. Uh, but yeah. on the other hand, I, I just wondering why they have a five copeck stamp with the issue yeah. if there was no rate for, for the five copeck. So uh, th thanks very much for that. I mean, I really appreciate it. No, no, no. Yeah. No, no, no. For, the, uh, for those of you, sorry. Yeah, for those of you who like to study history, um, aside from the postal side of history, I remember reading a book on the construction of the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway. And it's absolutely fascinating how that thing was built, given the harsh conditions of Siberia and the Russian winter and all that. And the big obstacle, which was Lake Baikal, which is about halfway through. And then and the geography of that lake meant that the trains during the summertime had to go on a ferry from one side of the lake to the other. And in wintertime, they used a sled kind of a service to get it across the frozen lake. Uh, just unbelievably fascinating uh, things. In, in the meantime, they built the railway to go all the way through on rail tracks. But in the early days up till, uh, I want to say like 1908 or 1912, they had to cross Lake Baikal by ferry and, and 
just just the incredible challenges of of building that thing. So if if anybody's interested in that history, I strongly recommend reading a a book on the uh, construction of the railway. Of course, there was also a kind all kinds of political stuff because they had to finance it and the interaction between China and 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 Russia and and all that stuff. Very very fascinating history. You're right. You're right. You got it. Yeah, I read the book. But in the first cover, I, the first uh, item I showed, um, that would have that would have gone through the Lake Baikal. Yeah, uh, that would have been well. But I haven't. <clears throat> I, I only got it quite recently, so I haven't really uh, pulled it to pieces yet. But the other, there's many interesting things. Like for example, when they, uh, of course, the Japanese. Uh, won the Russo-Japanese uh, war. And one of the things that happened was that they rebuilt the railway, which had been ruined, the China Eastern Railway. And they built it to a different gauge to the trans yes. 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 So <laughs> then you had sort of trains going up, you know, if you want politics to the nth degree, then that's probably yeah. Yeah, a lot of fascinating uh, yeah. subject. I think if you if you browse the internet, I think there is a um, a good exhibit on the, um, the Trans Siberian Railway, which you can see online. So I can't remember who is it or or where to get it. But I think, I think I what I actually did was accidentally, you know, sort of uh, went on the internet. Just typed the keywords and then found out that somebody has done uh, a very detailed um, exhibit on, on this particular subject, which you can right. actually see. I, I, have, I have seen that. There's lots of five postcards in there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you are. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, all right. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Richard. Any, any further questions from the floor? Anybody? Okay then. Uh, so thank you for for both Ingo and uh, Richard for the the excellent um, uh, presentation tonight of, of today. Um, and uh, uh, well, I've got an announcement to make. Is, is that uh, the uh, um, the latest journal, the October journal, uh, the, uh, all the journals have been uh, mailed. So. Um, uh, in the in the United in the States or Australia, and uh, you would probably receive it within maybe two weeks. But however, now the main the main problem is UK, which you uh, would have uh, too true. Yes, uh, <laughs> actually, I've been waiting for something that I bought from eBay for over a month and a half, and still hasn't arrived. So it must be due to the postal strike. Anyhow, so um, uh, the the post office said it would take. Uh, much longer than usual, even even if it, it was sent by email. So um, you know, if you if you really desperately want to see it, kindly let me know so I can actually send you a soft copy instead. So uh, there's there's nothing much I can do about it. So uh, anyhow, let's hope that the um, uh, uh, the postal strikes uh, uh, finished as as soon as possible. Um, Next Tuesday, maybe, okay. maybe with the Maybe if the with the appointment of new prime minister, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, yes, it, it's been a very pleasant uh, a, a day for you and an evening for me uh, to to see you all. And and I also noticed that Dr. Pakob, uh, uh, the, the, the FIP president and FIAP president, uh, is, is with us. So, uh, with Dr. Pakob would like to say a few words. Yes, good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank good you for joining uh, this uh, session. And thank you, uh, Ingo and uh, Richard, for both uh, presentation, especially uh, very interesting about the uh, so-called uh, dead country letters. But I think you have uh, got more than uh, anyone from uh, Hong Kong to the <laughs> so-called dead <laughs> country letter, right? I think, I, I think we'll be all, all, all looking into our closet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be interesting if yeah. uh, anyone can be the 
in goal uh, in that. I, I don't think uh, anybody can beat him, but uh, I think he, he, <laughs> might, he might have a few. <laughs> yes. No, and but given the given the that given the his uh, his definition of a dead country is so wide, I think we we we'll probably find a few things uh, hitting around. Um, and uh, well, okay. Uh, so um, if if there's uh, no further uh, 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 um. Implement anything you you like to present or any and uh, by the way I haven't actually actually asked are there any more uh, presentations to be made yes okay well uh, no more so uh, I'll I'll call it a day or an evening and um, I bid you farewell and uh, have a nice day or a nice morning or a nice evening and I'll see you next month. Uh, okay. Thanks everybody for joining. Bye. Uh, thank you. A, yeah. Thank it you. It was very a much. pleasure doing this. Sure, 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 sure. You better think of something else, Ingo. <laughs> You're <laughs> such a wonderful presenter, and, uh, and you said that you 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 were going to give us a, a twenty minutes uh, a talk, but you know it, it. I think I looked at I clocked it was one hour no. and twenty minutes. <laughs> so, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so long and uh, have a nice day. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>